Hey everyone, we're going to get started in a few minutes here. We're just working out a few details. All right, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Field Day's Knowing Wild Cats webinar series, week five. Today, we're gonna to talk about citizen scientists and engaging communities, and I have Ginger Thompson and Kat Gallo here to lead this presentation today. So I'm gonna let Ginger get started, and we can, uh, one thing I want to make clear to everyone is let's, we will take questions in the Q&A window. So throughout the talk, if you have questions you would like us to address at the end, please enter those in the Q&A and we will try to um, also respond in chat, but we're um, thinly staffed today. So enjoy the talk. Go ahead, Ginger. Hi, everybody. I'm having a few issues with the website there with the slideshow. So um, hello, and um, I'm um, I've been with Feel a Day for three a little over three years now. Um, so I'm happy to be here this evening. Um, Kat, did you want to just quickly introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, I'm Kat. I've been with Feel a Day for three years now, and if any of you are volunteers with us already, I'm sure you've seen my name plenty of times on our emails. Thank you. Um, so we're going to be speaking um, this evening a little bit about Feel a Day, but trying to give you all a perspective about why the work of um, citizen science and community engagement is so important to our mission, but also to preserving ecosystems across the globe. Um, so our mission here is to strengthen the conservation of native felid populations within local and global ecosystems using innovative approaches to research, education, and community stewardship. Um, that's what we've set out to do. We've been in um, existence since 2006 when we um, filed and received our 501c3 designation. We've studied felids all across the globe, actually, from snow leopards to a variety of different wildcats um, in Africa, in Mongolia, South America and um, across the US. Um, our work really is focused on three sort of pieces, research, um, and we have biologists on staff who work with us as researchers. We have um, an education program and we do a lot of community engagement and stewardship. And it's a combination we feel delivers the most um, potential to protect and preserve wild cats across the planet. Um, we've worked with about 45 organizations since inception, and, um, and we pride ourselves on, on that, those relationships. They've been great for us. Um, our research is um, really focused right now on the Bay Area and the Bay Area Puma Project. Um, where we work in all nine counties of the San Francisco Bay Area. And we've been studying these wildcats since 2008. And um, we are also in the process of studying them, really looking at other species as well, um, up to about 60 in um, the San Francisco Bay Area alone. Um, so we've published some research and currently we're working on a fragmentation study to look at habitat fragmentation and how fragmentation is evolving over time as the Bay Area continues its rapid development, rapid human development, um, and, and what that might imply for wildlife in the future. We're also in the process of doing that fragmentation work, studying what's happening with wildlife 
pre and post COVID-19 um, as people stayed at home looking at whether wildlife behavior has changed significantly in that time. So our education program, we call it CATAWARE, um, is given K-12 to schools all across the Bay Area. Um, we have also given classes at universities and junior colleges. And um, our curriculum is really based on um, sort of using this wonderful species that's local to Bay Area students to talk about um, biodiversity and, um, and help young people really understand that they're living in this incredible biodiversity hotspot and how exciting it is to start to learn about science and research when the apex predator and this beautiful creature is right in your backyard. Um, our community work um, has involved really encouraging people in the Bay Area to protect the wildlife and natural habitats um, around them. And um, we do a lot of work to dispel misinformation. Pumas have been considered scary creatures, nuisances, all kinds of negative um, kind of perceptions about pumas. Um, and so we do a lot of work to dispel that and to raise existence about how easily we really can coexist with pumas when we can be thoughtful and hopefully with development authorities when our development can be thoughtful and consider the wildlife in our area. Um, 500 volunteers, more than 500 volunteers have worked with Fila Day over the last many years and we've had citizen scientists, data managers, event managers. Um, we work with bookkeepers, accountants, with designers, with artists, with writers. Um, there are so many ways people can get involved in the work that we do. But it's really critical to us that we have such a wonderful cadre of volunteers who help us. And that's a big part of what we're here to talk about today. Um, another piece of our work, and again, also dependent on volunteers, is the technologies that we've developed and will continue to develop to support our conservation work. Um, so we hey, developed teacher. a sightings map, which we're going to talk a little bit more about later on. Um, we have a Google Assistant app, which allows you to make sightings using your voice rather than having to go to a computer and type it in. You can use a cell phone to do it. Ginger, um, so um, I, I'm going to stop you for a minute. We, yeah, we yeah, have a yeah. bunch of, so the talk is not forwarding and um, we are getting a bunch of questions about that. So I want to know if there's a way you can uh, step back um, from the play mode and see if we can see the slides because people are not seeing any slides. Oh, so. oh okay. Let me see what I can do here. Um, is that better? Yeah, it's it's definitely better. It's not full screen, but if that's the way we need to um, go through it, I think that's better than one slide. So what I would encourage you to do, since um, the visuals are great for people, is just to go back to the first slide and maybe you can go through it so that people can follow your narrative. Okay, so. Sorry about I'm, that, everybody. Little sorry, technical details. And, and unfortunately, I can't see the chat when I have the screen share up. So, um, should we be talking to these or is it enough to just run through them quickly? Yeah, I would just touch base on what you covered already and just highlight. Okay, so this, this is about published research and to talk a little bit about our fragmentation study and our little or sort of smaller study on the impact of COVID-19. So how wildlife is using open spaces pre and post COVID-19. Um, this is our education program, CATAWARE, which is given to K-12 students, but we also adapt it for um, college-age students as well. Um, our community program um, is really designed to engage 
local stakeholders and um, helps us recruit volunteers and also raise awareness for this incredible wildlife and these pumas. Um, the volunteers do all kinds of things and you can see we have many categories of volunteering. Um, and, and I was saying before, it's so important that our citizen scientists and data managers help us because at the root of everything we do is our research and our research helps inform our education and our community programs. Um, we also use technologies and here on the upper right hand corner you can see an image from our Puma Wild game which is a mobile app game um, and it's available on across the platforms um, and it's really hard and um, I don't know if it's generational, but I'm incapable of staying alive as a puma. So it's hard, it's fun, and it actually does share what it's like to be a puma in the wild as development encroaches. Then we have a, a predator prey simulator on the BAP website, and you can find um, that at BAP.org. And that's to show how puma populations vary with prey populations. Um, we, we have a, a several other um, technologies that we're developing right now to make um, kind of nature accessible and fluid and to build our, our database. And we'll talk about those in a minute. Um, so our database has approximately 6 million images of terrestrial wildlife around the Bay Area. And um, all of these images have to be cataloged for the species that are being shown on the images. And um, they also have to be categorized for um, human population as well as animal populations. Um, and we are developing a cloud-based database for these images so that they can be much more accessible, not only to everybody helping us catalog the data, but also to other researchers who might be studying different species. Um, the, the, again, the number of species involved is somewhere north of 60. So we have a lot of animals that we're, we're seeing on these cameras. Um, and then we're developing some AI um, machine learning to help us identify the species so that there's less of the um, particularly the early stage of cataloging eliminating blank images that sort of thing um, and and more robust um, cataloging that's automated um, finally engaging communities we have basically and this is sort of where i left off so i'll go into this in some detail here um, essentially we believe that engaging communities is a key to preserving wildlife, particularly in and around urban areas. Um, you know, in, in the wilderness, it, we have less issues around protection of these extraordinary species, but around urban areas, as development grows and the human population continues to grow, um, we really need local communities to be a big part of, if not a key part of, the conservation. So um, our work, our, our commitment is to go to communities that invite us to come and work with them um, in identifying what's happening with wild felids in their area, particularly with pumas. Um, the communities we work with are living along what we call the urban wildland edge, and that's, you know, where your properties abut open spaces, national parks, state parks, um, and other large tracts of land that are um, accessible to wildlife. Um, we believe the involvement of local residents offers credibility to the research. If, if you've actually seen this research underway and you're a part of the collection of the data and you recognize that, oh, a mountain lion has only been by this camera once in three months, you start to get a sense of the size of the population, the actual size of the population, the frequency of visits, that sort of thing. Um, and so the credibility around what conservationists are saying begins to be enhanced by the support of the local communities. 
And then um, we firmly believe that local stakeholders are the best spokespeople for their ecosystems. So we work with that. Um, so um, community stewardship and, and is, is a many faceted thing, but um, we work with data collection, data cataloging, messaging, and community outreach with our volunteers and um, volunteers in the field. And Kat's gonna take us through those pieces in just a little bit here. So Kat, you wanna take over? Yeah, so a great way to help is through citizen science. And one of those ways would be field work. We have over 140 cameras placed at any particular moment for our research. And a great way to help out if you really like hiking, if you like being outdoors, is to help us maintain these cameras and check them routinely. So volunteers are typically assigned up to five cameras in our particular study grid. And these cameras are checked every four to six weeks. During that check, you'll go ahead, refresh the batteries, make sure the angles are correct so we're getting good photos of the wildlife and also collecting the SD cards and putting in some new ones. So we do have some great photos here just to show you what it looks like when you're out in the field. You may catch yourself on camera and you also see a good variety of our volunteers here. We have some that have been with us for five or more years even, and some of them that are just starting out this year. So this is a really great way to get involved, whether you have experience or not. You can always learn by going out with a field day staff member or one of our more experienced volunteers to learn how to set up these cameras and maintain them. And when it comes to getting the data to us, there you can send it to us through our Dropbox. Um, if you're in the Mountain Valley area, you can go ahead, stop by the office, or you can go ahead and mail it to us. And this is just uh, one part of the multi-step process of collecting all this data for our research. And so the next step would be cataloging all of this data. And this is another great way to be involved and help out remotely. For this, we use a program called CameraBase to enter data remotely of these images and videos taken from our trail cameras. But as Ginger mentioned earlier, we are looking to move to a cloud database. So while this is our current setup, keep your eyes open for that new setup coming very soon. And to do this, you'll need two applications, the first being TeamViewer, which is a free to use application and that just allows you to connect to our computer in office and that's how you're able to work remotely. And the camera based program, which is already on that computer in our office. And this is a pretty straightforward program to use. You'll just need a quick training session with me first. And we also have this great image that you can see here that a volunteer sent over while they were working on a data set, they notice this really funny image of a spotted skunk and it looks to be chasing off a little gray fox there. I'm gonna um, go back up a couple of frames mm -hmm. um, to, talk, uh, to talk just to show a video, if that's all right. Yeah, that's fine. Um, I just think everybody missed this, but this is um, a community in a community why we're doing this work. and an example of um, what people are capturing on their cameras right at home. So living on the urban edge is a key factor here. And next we have this, uh, another fun video that we have available. It's a little black bear and you'll notice mama bear is kind of messing up with our camera there a bit. And this would be in the Napa area. It's always surprising what we capture on these cameras. Some surprises more exciting than others. <laughs> hmm. And so when it comes to our program, Camera Base, as I mentioned, you will need a quick training session with me. That'll be done via a Zoom call. And it typically takes around an hour. And in that phone call, we'll go ahead and walk you through the program, get you started, start to finish working through a data set. 
And once you go through it the first time, you'll see it's a really straightforward program to use. There is a screenshot there off to the side at the top right. Um, so you can see you'll be able to take a look at the photos and go ahead and type in the species you're seeing. In that case, we have a great photo of a coyote looking right at the camera. And the great thing about this program, again, is that you can access it at any point in time. So whether you're a night owl or a morning person, or you know you're on the East Coast or somewhere international, it'll always be working and running. So you can go ahead and schedule at your own convenience. And this is also a really great way to learn how to ID a lot of California's native wildlife. As you saw through these photos and videos, we really get a great variety and we have cameras all throughout the Bay Area. So you really get to see a lot of different species and you get to see where, they're, where they are in different areas of the Bay Area as well. Um, and you get to see some really great stuff that you probably wouldn't normally be able to see like this photo at the bottom corner here with the mountain lion and some prey. Looks like a looks like a fox, but I'm not sure. What do you think, Kat? I don't know. Can we go to tell. the photo? <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, and another piece of this community um, stewardship is um, volunteers also have been willing to help us with messaging um, and um, messaging on sites like next door um, with local news services even with um, television services that sort of thing is an incredibly important piece of this community work um, so if you look at the middle part of this slide it's hard to read but essentially somebody on next door was claiming to have seen a puma and put up this photograph and this photograph is not a mountain lion it's actually a bobcat um, a tall bobcat, albeit, but not a mountain lion. And um, when people hear mountain lions are in a neighborhood, falsely or positively, they get very, very, um, can get very upset and concerned and worried about their pets. And, um, and when they're not correct, which frequently can be the case, so when they may falsely accuse a mountain lion of taking a pet or a chicken or something like that, um, very often the mountain lion gets in trouble or a mountain lion somewhere in the vicinity gets in trouble. So messaging becomes extremely important um, and, and an important way for volunteers to help because the more people start to feel comfortable with the notion that this wildlife exists and that mountain lions exist in, in the Bay Area, um, the better off these wild animals will be um, for the most part. Um, on the right hand side of the screen is um, a picture, a screenshot from our sightings map and all the flags are sightings of mountain lions and bobcats in the Bay Area and um, some verified, some not verified. So it's a good way if you or a friend of yours thinks about, thinks they've seen a mountain lion Communicating it through the sightings map is great and it's helpful to our research um, and allows us to try and see, you know, to begin to see movement patterns and that sort of thing. Um, you can use that Google um, Assistant app to make sightings by voice, which is pretty cool. Um, and then, um, yeah, so the, the piece on the right hand side of, um, excuse me, on the left hand side of the screen is um, an article. Um, from the local ABC website um, in this area talking about an increase in activity of mountain lions recently and close to the urban centers, which um, we believe is true. And, um, and that has a lot to do with why we're taking on the studying of this fragmentation around the Bay Area is to try and understand, you know, where these populations are being squeezed. And the camera data helps that. Um, finally, this community stewardship, we have started a program that we call Wild Backyard, um, and, and I'll refer to it as WILD, which is designed to engage communities as a whole in our stewardship. And um, we are inviting people to submit their photographs, their films, 
Um, many, many people are using surveillance cameras at their homes now. It's become affordable to do that. And lo and behold, these cameras capture some pretty interesting stuff. So this is an image from, or a video from a Nest camera, a security camera. And there we have a mountain lion crossing right through somebody's patio. Um, this provides us with great information. We can record the GPS location of these videos and um, know that there's a mountain lion passing through. One of the downsides of the perpetuation of surveillance cameras is that more people are seeing lions, mountain lions and bobcats more often than they had in the past. And in fact, that makes some people believe there are more of these animals in these areas than there were in the past. And we don't know that that's true. We know they're being seen more, but we think it may be um, a reflection of the number of cameras rather than the number of cats. Um, so, um, but when used to actually participate in the research by sharing data with us through these cameras, it becomes a really powerful tool for us to try and understand how the um, ecosystem is, is thriving or not in a different area. We did a one-year pilot in La Honda, California, in San Mateo County, that um, engaged 30 people in that local community, it's a small community, um, in a project to understand the activity of pumas in the um, vicinity of the town center of La Honda, of Cuesta La Honda. And um, 30 people checked 30 cameras for us. Um, there were members of the community who took on responsibility for communicating with everybody for messaging their neighbors um, when issues came up. Um, and the project was very successful in reducing fear and in inviting this larger community of La Honda to um, begin a more serious effort to steward the wildlife in their area. Um, we were invited there because people were really frightened and thinking that there were a lot more mountain lions and um, you know, dangerous creatures than, um, than we felt was probably the case. But without their actually seeing the information and participating in the data collection, they were having a hard time believing that there were just a few or handful or a normal level of, of pumas in the area. And by participating for a year in checking the cameras, um, in collecting what are some iconic images of, of wildlife. Um, this community began to understand that they weren't being overrun by mountain lions. Um, and so we felt that fear was reduced, that positive attitudes increased towards mountain lions. We had people who were so afraid they could barely go outside, they were so worried about mountain lions. And that level of fear was wildly reduced, which is great. So we have five projects in development now in the Wild Backyard Program. Um, and some are underway, some are in the planning phases. Um, and together they represent more than 100,000 Bay Area residents. Um, so, you know, conservation is a people issue, not an animal issue. So if we can all work together to preserve, that's the best. And having everybody's participation in the process is what really makes it work. Um, so we will be using, we will be developing a, an app, a mobile app that will invite, it's actually mobile and, um, and, com and computer-based, that will invite the public to contribute their images to this vital data set. And um, in the meanwhile, if any of you on the call are living in the local area and seeing wildlife on your cameras, surveillance or otherwise, please, please send them to us and we will have them part of our um, study data, which is really helpful to us. Thank you so much for um, joining us this evening. That really wraps up what we were hoping to share with you. And we wanted to leave plenty of time for discussion and questions and wonder if there are questions out there that anybody would like to um, 
pose. Maybe Courtney, you can share Zara. I, I will, um, I'll just read these out. These, so I, I, we could have answered these, but I think we'd like to have this as a public uh, list of questions for the ending here, but I'm gonna put this to you, Kat, mm -hmm. because you work with uh, most of the volunteers. So Richard asks, any need for volunteers on cataloging right now? Yes, <laughs> always, like, yeah. always welcome it. <laughs> So should, uh, should Richard reach out to you or yeah. anyone else who's interested? Yeah, anyone Great. who's interested, you could email me. My email is listed on this slide, Catherine at fieladayfund.org, and I'll schedule a training with you. Great. And uh, that's all up on the screen there. The next question is from Marnell, and um, this is a good question. When we move to a cloud-based database for camera trap photos, Will that mean all volunteers helping with cataloging will need to be retrained to use the new system? Um, I will say yes, and I don't think it's going to be too painful. Um, it's actually a great system we're building. It, it will probably be quite a bit simpler for everybody. And um, currently right now, Kat, you, you, as you mentioned, the, the trainings are pretty short and simple and straightforward and people, people get a, a hang of it pretty quickly. Yeah, definitely. After the first time going through it with me, people pretty much have no problem using it and they only get faster <laughs> using it really. Yeah, so the cloud, the cloud based uh, database, our WildPod database will um, we'll have just an, an entry screen on a URL, so web-based, and that, what that will enable us to do is have as many volunteers as would like entering data at the same time, and that's something that is difficult for us to do now. So this will increase our throughput of data, which is really excellent, and uh, it will be user-friendly. Next question is from Stacy. Curious where the five projects are. So Ginger, you wanna speak to that? They're not all um, launched yet, so yeah, you can yeah. So yeah. The ones that are actually launched are um, in Kings Mountain, which is in San Mateo County. And it's really a, a community of Woodside. Um, and it's, you know, up, up in the, in the ridges um, along the, the sort of overseeing La Honda and the coast. Um, and it's a fantastic community and they have a lot of wildlife in there. The community abuts this um, San Francisco Public Utilities um, District, SFPUC, down by Crystal Springs Lake. It's a large open space. So there's a lot of wildlife coming through that area. And they reached out to us um, hearing about the La Honda project and asked if we would come and do a project there. So that's underway. Um, we have another project in Henry Coe State Park and we were invited there by um, a group of volunteers and the um, Henry Coe Park team um, and a woman named Susan Ferry to come and do kind of a base analysis of what's going on with pumas. Maybe you can talk to that a little bit more, Zara. Yeah, that so that's really just a, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's as natural as it gets in Henry Co. And so it's a good control site for us to um, compare our data from the urban edge communities that we're working in. And as Ginger was talking about, we have some that are underway. La Honda is the only one that so far has been completed. We have plans and are laying the groundwork for these community programs in the Pacifica area and El Granada, where there's, there are quite a few sightings on a regular basis. And we get them also on our uh, research cameras. And we have plans to initiate a project in the Diablo region. And we were talking about Marin. We haven't quite determined um, the timing on that yet. Right, Ginger? Right. 
Yeah, we're wait, we're wait, we're waiting a little bit on Moran, where you know, the number of um, mountain lions is still pretty well unknown. We've spotted a couple on our cameras, but not a lot. But um, we don't know what that population is looking at like. We are we are doing a bobcat study up in Moran, and that would be a great you know a great way to engage communities as well. But we're right. We're so I'm gonna. I'm also going to tie this uh, question or what we're speaking about right now to another question that came in about um, other communities we may be considering. And, and I will mention that a great deal of our data collection currently exists south of San Francisco on the peninsula down to the Santa Cruz Mountains. And there are multiple communities in and around there including our previous project in La Honda, where you know, this community work makes a lot of sense. So we're looking at those as well, and um, other communities that are just south of the city, um, in addition to East Bay. So we are open to working with communities that have this need and or are interested in working with us. So some other questions here. Um, what is your study area from Angelina? I'm in Santa Cruz, Sokol, and wondering if my area is part of your study. Uh, currently, Angelina, we have cameras just sort of north of you, but we're, you know, closest to you would just be um, a little bit north from where you are in Sokol. And we used to have a lot of more, a lot more activity around there, but I think we're not not so much focused down in the Santa Cruz area at this time. Um, so, but reach out to us if you're interested in a particular area. I know Los Gatos is a big area for sightings as well, and there's a lot of Puma activity around that area. Yeah. Okay, another question from Chloe. Hey, Chloe. How do communities learn about Field Day's community projects? Do you advertise to communities in any way or do most communities contact you first? I'm gonna let you answer that, Ginger. Um, we work on yeah. this together, go for it. So sometimes it's um, outreach, sometimes it's a news story that might um, stimulate a group to reach out to Field Day, but generally, those communities are reaching out to us and we're not going to them. Um, the, um, you know, we're not advertising or marketing this prod, this, this approach. Uh, so we're really letting communities come to us. Now what happens is just as what happened in our La Honda project, somebody learns that there's a meeting about mountain lions and for whatever reason they decide to attend a community meeting that's an open meeting so for our first meeting in la honda we had over 100 people there um, and um, then they learn about what we're doing maybe just word of mouth and ask us to come and talk to them and um, generally we start these projects with a presentation about mountain lions um, and try to be as specific as we can to the area that that the the community is in. Um, so before we ever even start a, a wild backyard project, we're doing a presentation on mountain lions to help people understand what's going on with the animals. And if there is enthusiasm, interest, tremendous fear, um, anyway, and a, a sort of emotional response, then we'll suggest, you know, you might want to consider doing this kind of project with us. And um, it obviously requires there be a, you know, a good cadre of volunteers to help because we can't do it alone. We're a small team and we can't do it alone. So we love it when communities reach out to us and that's really how um, our work has evolved so far. Great, thank you. Next question from Deborah. Is there a minimum number of weekly hours that cataloging volunteers are expected to commit to? Um, you know, I'll let either of you guys answer that. We, we are pretty open. <laughs> yeah, Kat, you should take that one. Yeah, I, we don't necessarily have a weekly requirement. 
Ideally, uh, we would like, you know, something around 20 hours per month. But again, this is a volunteer position that's really flexible. So whenever you have time available, if you can go on and contribute an hour, that's always helpful. Great. Yeah. So if you are interested in cataloging and you don't have a lot of time, this should be a really great fit for you because you can fit it in between the uh, between the edges of the slots of other things. So think about it. Our next question, um, I'm gonna, so this is from Stacy, and I'm gonna give this to Courtney um, just because she is now living over there. Um, so Courtney, you see the question, but I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna read it out and then you can answer it. So thank you for those answers from Stacy, any recent credible East Bay sightings? Okay, so um, I'm Courtney. I'm the wildlife biologist with Felidae, just in case um, anybody doesn't know who I am. But I'm also living in Walnut Creek right now, so I'm in the East Bay. Um, from what I can tell, we haven't had any uh, increase in the rate of sightings. Um, I've been in touch with some colleagues at Diablo State Park. Um, they've had a number of sightings reported to them in and around Diablo, but nothing has been confirmed yet. Um, so there's been some kills or some dead deer, but they have not been confirmed as coming from mountain lions. Um, and also sightings, but no photos or anything. So nothing's been confirmed in and around at least where I live um, in that part of the East Bay. Great, thanks Courtney. One thing I'll add to that is that in East Bay, if you live over there, you have some really nice habitat for pumas in Edmud. And uh, we routinely have picked them up on cameras over the years in that protected area. And then uh, we just recently had a, um, a security camera reported to us, right, Courtney, just south of Diablo, Pleasanton area? Or right, in, in, Alamo? Al in Alamo. Yeah, it was Alamo. So in between like Lafayette, Walnut Creek, and Danville area, um, yeah. there was a confirmed sighting there. <laughs> it was before the shelter in place started, though. Great. Next question from Marnell. You mentioned you do presentations at colleges as well as elementary high schools. Do you have master students working with you as well? Uh, Ginger, you wanna take that? Sure, um, so um, Marnell, yes, we do. Um, we have um, and consistently have um, a number of interns who work with us. And the interns have definitely um, gone with us to some of our presentations. Um, we have a number of biologists involved with Fila Day and um, some volunteer and will go to schools with us. And we love volunteers to help us with this education program. So um, I think from the two perspectives, if, if you are at a university and looking for uh, lecture talk on mountain lions we do do that if you're a master's student and you're interested in helping us with that program that would be great too um, so I think the answer is yes and I hope I've I've gotten the gist of your question correctly yeah thank you and we also work with a number of international students at all levels uh, we've we've had actually middle school junior high school and high school kids volunteering with us we've also had college and uh, graduate students and postdocs so it's varied everyone is welcome question from barbara beasley what is involved in checking cameras where are they typically located easy or hard to access partner with others so how about you want to take that ginger and cat one of you guys yeah cat you want to jump on that one yeah so when it comes to checking the cameras typically you'll be going 
on a hike. We have uh, this application called maps.me in a file we share with you guys, and that'll help guide you to the location if you don't know where it is exactly. Uh, we also like to send first timers out with, you know, an experienced volunteer or staff member to help them. And you'll go ahead, check the camera, make sure the batteries are okay. If they need to be exchanged, you'll go ahead, swap them out with some fresh batteries. Um, you'll take the SD card and swap that out with a new one so that we can get the SD card with all the data and make sure that the camera's functioning properly, the angle's good, everything's set for some good photos. And of course, we welcome you guys to go ahead and go in pairs, bring a friend along if you wanna get them going and help check the cameras with you. And the great thing about this, again, is we do have so many cameras, over 140. So uh, just let us know if you're interested and where you're located and we'll check around to see which study grid we can get you set up helping out in. Yeah, and we have cameras in a variety of types of locations. Some are a bit hard to access and really do require a good, you know, few mile hike in, but others are close to closer to roads and easier to get to. So there is a variety um, of, there are a variety of cameras you can access. So yeah, let us know. Yeah, we actually don't usually have too much trouble pairing people with the right camera, cameras to check. So that usually isn't a problem. Question from Richard, how would you address a trophy hunter about the importance of pumas? Is it harder than the general public? Ginger, you wanna take a stab? Well, I think I can start on that one. Um, I would say the answer is it's definitely harder. Um, although um, trophy hunters sometimes shift their perspective um, when dealing with endangered animals. Um, and, and many trophy hunters, in fact, are um, conservationists in their own minds and in their own rights. Um, so it's a tricky one. Um, I'd say there are, there are populations of people for whom no scientific evidence is enough to convince them that they shouldn't do what they want to do. Um, and um, some of that has to do with lifestyles and some of that has to do with, you know, behaviors they've developed since childhood. Um, you know, it's a deep psychological issue. And so I think it is really tricky. And, um, and depending on, you know, who that bounty hunter might be, um, I think it can be difficult, but there are plenty of bounty hunters who, you know, eventually stop hunting animals that are more endangered because they recognize their importance in, in the ecosystem in which they live. I, I was recently in um, Jackson Hole, Wyoming and um, speaking to a small group of people who were interested in understanding, you know, how pumas affect a landscape. And once they understood the role they play in the ecosystem, they were quite surprised um, to learn that these animals function so importantly in ecosystems. And I think it had some people thinking twice about, you know, what they were doing when they're hunting. So I would say it can be difficult, but you know, you can't make a sweeping statement. Zara, any other thoughts? No, I think it's, I think that's a good general response. I think, uh, there, you know, if you really are interested in digging into the science and understanding better the complexity of these systems and the role that a puma in particular plays in it, we uh, are happy to help you there. If you, uh, if you want to reach out and ask us for more info, we're happy to provide that. But uh, it depends on the hunter too. It really depends on that particular individual. We have run into both types and, uh, you know, it can be challenging, but we've also had some really interesting developments with trophy hunters over the years who did change their positions and some after working with us. So that was pretty fun. I have one more question here from Angelina. Is there potential for your group to work with people who are seeking depredation permits? Ah, uh, yes. So that's a great topic and I'm going to let Ginger, get into that. I'm happy to 
you know, tag on at the end and say some, give, give some thoughts as well. But it's a good question. Thanks, Angelina. Yeah, I mean, I think the answer, Angelina, is yes. And in fact, in our La Honda group, there were definitely people who were um, interested in getting depredation permits. And we haven't, we don't have that, the information yet, the data yet on whether the requests for depredation permits have actually declined since we did the project there. But that's one of the data pieces we're looking for and hope to have. Um, but um, my sense is that working with individuals to understand the more the more someone is informed about the um, circumstances for pumas and bobcats and coyotes, the better able they are to think through that decision to seek and act upon a depredation permit. And um, I think within the geography that we work in, we'd be really happy to to talk with people about that and in fact have done so we we have had many phone calls and in-person meetings um, when we're able with um, individuals who are concerned and looking for advice about whether to get a depredation permit or not when a pet's been taken or something you know or uh, livestock has been taken yeah in addition to that we also will respond to requests uh, from individuals or small hobby animal owners who have had a loss and they would like a camera placed and they would like for us to come in and investigate and guide them and so we do offer offer those services as well a question from mike hunt are you working with ranchers and farmers on teaching them <clears throat> how to protect their farm animals uh, yes we are Michael, and we, we do that whenever, again, we're requested or th there is a need. Um, I will also let Ginger add thoughts to that. Yeah, I mean, so we're, we're, we're certainly aware of lots of um, mediations for, um, for this kind of conflict. And so we encourage, we actively encourage ranchers, um, and farmers to use those interventions. Um, and we're very happy to work with them. And I think some are more receptive than others to working with a conservation group, but we certainly do not pass judgment, <coughs> despite the fact that we love pumas and want to see them around. We also recognize that occasionally there can be an animal that's um, become very problematic. Um, so we are happy to work with ranchers and farmers and help them intervene in, in these conflicts so that pumas don't have to be um, taken out as a result of them. So, yeah. Yeah, and I'll add to that. We have a project we're considering moving forward on that in, in one way addresses that question or directly addresses, addresses the challenges for um, farmers and small hobby animal owners. And that is uh, using lights and sound to deter pumas. So this is something that we may be piloting somewhat soon on the, on the peninsula here. So we'll keep you guys posted on that. Question, what should we do when we encounter a wild puma? Any of you can take that question. Well, maybe you should take it since you have. <laughs> I'll let, I'll, if I have something to say after, I will. But I think, I think it'd be great for you guys to answer that question. What do Pat, you think? Pat, you want to jump in? So if you do encounter a wild puma, just be big, as big as you can be. Raise your arms up. Be really loud. And uh, just, you know, don't run away, don't turn your back to it. So just back up slowly. If it's not moving, you know, give it some space. <laughs> yeah, don't let it think you're prey. In other words, um, which is why you don't run away. You can stare it down, you can throw things at it. Um, you can do anything to make yourself look really big and loud and mean and nasty. And it's highly likely that Puma will run the other direction. Great. Yeah, I would, I would just say um, most actual sightings 
are the tail of a puma as it runs off into the brush. So we're not all, you know, fortunate enough to have a really nice encounter or one at all. Most of us will never see one. So um, on that note, we have one more question. I'm going to have Courtney, will you answer this about um, the Puma project at UCSC and our work and how yeah. it yeah. is related? Great, thank you. Um, so uh, we originally um, formed in the same group as the Puma project at UCSC back in um, 2006. Um, obviously, we've since split off. The UCSC project remains in the Santa Cruz area um, in some parts of very southern um, San Mateo County. Um, and we've kind of started working in the rest of the Bay. Um, their research program is um, a bit more um, straightforward biology. So they're very interested in um, behavior, in energetics, in movement. Um, they do a lot of collaring down there, um, whereas we primarily rely on um, cameras for our data at this point. Um, our research program is slightly different in that we're um, very focused on management issues. How, how can we um, coexist with pumas in our um, growing urban environment? And how can we plan for future development and be able to main, maintain pumas and other wildlife? Um, in the Bay Area. So just a slightly different focus of our research programs and um, some different methods that we use to collect our data. Great, thank you, Courtney. And I think that's going to wind it up for us today. Um, anything else you guys want to add at the, at the end of this before we sign off? I don't think you played that video, Ginger. For well, everybody, this one right here. that last little, yeah, thinking about rubbing on our hair snare. All right. So, anything else, Courtney? You wanted to plug some of our previous webinars. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that um, the webinar today was really great. Kind of an overview of what we're working on right now. If you want to dig in a little bit deeper and. Um, find out more about our specific research program, you can um, message one of us to get a link to the webinar I did, I guess, a month now ago. Um, and that goes into a lot more detail about the research program. Um, also, last week and, and the week before that, we had Dave Stoner and then Christian um, talk a little bit more about other Puma research programs going on in um, Utah and down in Chile, which might be of interest to some of you as well. So if you're interested in watching any of those past webinars, um, just reach out and we can send those to you. Great, thank you. All right, so we're gonna sign off. Thank you so much, Ginger and Kat. And any of you that have questions, please reach out the emails are here on the screen and we will provide this webinar, uh, make it available in the next uh, 24 to 48 hours. Yeah, and thank you all for attending and yeah, for the great for question. Thank you, everyone have a great evening and take good care. Bye.